Welcome to the Life United Podcast. We are all about helping you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. We know that today's message is going to be a blessing to you. The last, um, the last few weeks uh, I've been talking about, other than I had a little pause from, from Mother's Day for the last couple of weeks, I've, I've been talking about balancing your faith. And I want to just kind of jump back on that today and, uh, and share some things with you because, listen, you're going to have to learn to live a balanced life of faith when you're in challenging times because that, that's when your faith is going to show up, show out, or disappear. And, and so you've got to understand and realize that we live in three dimensions of faith. And, and sometimes I think people kind of co-mingle these, and sometimes they push one to the side and, and, and for another one. But, but you've got to balance your faith in all these areas. And let me explain it to you. I've already talked about this, but this, just so you, for reference. First of all, you've got a, there is a faith that you have to live in the past. The surety of the sacrifice of Jesus. Look, listen, when Jesus died on the cross and, and he was raised from the dead, there was a anchor set in the rock that you can hold on to. That happened, and it happened for you, and it happened so that you could have eternal life. And so everybody, you've got to hold on to that. But I know particularly one particular uh, man I was talking to a while back, I was talking to him about the Lord and, and really trying to get him more involved in the kingdom. And he made this statement to me. He said, Sam, I walk that aisle, and that's all I'm going to do. So all of his faith is in the past. Is that going to get him to heaven? I, I, I believe it will. I don't know. I mean, but that's really the way a lot of, they don't do anything about the present. They just said, well, I did that. I accepted that sacrifice and that's it. But I want to tell you something. You've got to live by faith in the present. You've got to have confidence uh, of living by what Jesus did. His death, burial, and resurrection gave us a new path of life while we're on this earth. There's more to it than just accepting the past and accepting what Jesus did. We've got to live now. And we've got to balance our faith in that. But then there is another area, and this is what I want to talk about today. And that is that you've got to live by faith in the future. You've got to live by faith in the expectation, now listen to me, of the return of the Lord Jesus. You cannot, you, see people live, they live in all three different worlds and, and sometimes people they don't, they just live in the past like this friend of mine. Well, you know, that's just religion. And you know, and then you kind of go to church on Sunday to pay homage to what Jesus did. Well, since Jesus died for me, I guess I ought to go to church a couple times a month. Guess I ought to show up and put some money in the offering every once in a while. But that's not living in the present. Because we have to live a life now. But then there is another aspect. And a lot of people, they live in the expectation that, yeah, Jesus is going to come back, but Hey, who knows when, who knows? I mean, that's so far down the road. Who, who knows? I don't, have, I don't have much to do with that. Or you do just the opposite. You live the best you can just kind of making it on the earth, saying, Jesus, I wish you'd hurry up and come back and get me out of this. Which that's not right either. Because we live by faith in what Jesus did, we live by faith today because what he did gives us power today. And we also live by fact that he is coming back. Jesus is coming back. So I've talked about the past relationship in regard to the present relationship. The fact that Jesus is the same. 
yesterday, today, and forever. That what he did yesterday, he'll do for you today. That's good news. But I want to talk to you about the present future relationship that you have to have by faith with the Lord. And let me explain, uh, let me just share this with you. This is kind of a, I saw this uh, on the news here recently. A Harvard professor said this, belief in the afterlife is a malignant delusion since it actually devalues lives and discourages action that make life longer, safer, and happier. Now, what he's really trying to say is that it's only Christians who want to get back to normal. And they're not afraid of the virus because even if they died, they just go to heaven. And so he's saying that devalues everybody else. Well, see, the problem with that is this. He doesn't know Christians. He doesn't know that, that that's more, there's more to what we do and how we live than just the fact that, hey, we don't care because Jesus is coming back. And if he doesn't, I'm going to heaven. That is a fact. And it ought to be part of our faith. But it ought to be connected to how we live today. Because, see, he doesn't know real Christians. Because if he knew real Christians, he'd know that today they have compassion on other people. They care about other people. They pray for other people. They're not trying to devalue anyone. But basically what they're doing is they're calling us fanatics. And there's a spirit behind that. Trying their best to separate us out which probably is going to happen sometime in the future if Jesus doesn't come back soon. But here's the thing that I want you to listen to today, and this is very important. What's going to happen when Jesus comes back should drive your life and your lifestyle of faith today. We live by what Jesus did and the sacrifice he did, and we live by faith to live the life we have to live now. But there's another dimension. And that is that we live the life we have today because Jesus is coming back. And you've got to understand and know that that's part of how we have to live our life of faith. Balancing how we live today based on what's going to happen in the future. It ought to motivate you how you live today. Over in Luke, chapter 19, beginning in verse 11 and 12, Jesus talked about a, a man, and this man, they thought Jesus was coming to set up his kingdom, and so Jesus said, no, I need to tell you what's going to really happen. And he said this in a parable. He said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. That's Jesus. Jesus went into heaven to receive his kingdom. Guess what? And he's going to return. So Jesus goes on in the parable and he picks three people, three men. He gives one of them a certain number of, 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 of dollars, we would call it, or gifts. He gave another one a certain number and he gave another a certain number. So he gave all three of them gifts according to their ability. And so, guess what happened? The nobleman came back. And you know what happened when he came back? He said, uh, excuse me, um, what would you do with what I gave you? Well, Lord, I doubled what you gave me. Well done, good and faithful servant. I'm giving you rewards. Uh, the other, um, what'd you do with what I gave you? I doubled what you gave me. Well done. I'm going to give you more. Third one. What'd you do with what I gave you? Well, I was afraid of you. And so I hid it and here it is. It's just me. He wasn't as happy about him. In fact, he said something that we don't 
really preach much today or you don't hear much today. He said, take what that guy's got and give it to the guy who did more. What's the point? The point is, Jesus is coming back and he's gonna, there's going to be an inspection. And see, we, we don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. I just want to live and get by. And No, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let you do that. I mean, I'm your pastor. I'm going to tell you the truth. So with that in mind, you should allow your life today to be dictated by what he's going to do when he comes back. Now, you don't have to fear he's going to cast you in the pit of hell, but I want to tell you something. You've got to be ready. When he returns, let me read something to you. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Listen to this. Behold, I am coming soon. Now, see, you're soon and his soon. You, you can't judge his soon by your soon. Because your soon may be this afternoon. It may be tomorrow. When we were remodeling our house, Lord, oh, Jesus, thank God we're through. But I would have, I would have one of the, the, the people that were working out, well, we're going to finish that soon. What does that mean? You know, the Bible says a day is with a thousand years and a thousand years is with a day with the Lord. So you can't measure soon. But Jesus said, I'm coming soon, and it ought to mean something to you. Because listen to what he said. And I shall bring my wages and rewards with me to repay and render to each one just what his own actions and his work merit. Uh, that's what it says. That's what it says. What your work merits. That ought to be a motivation. Because if you study this out, you'll find out they're going to they're people who everything that they thought that was good is going to be burned up and all that's going to be saved is them. And there's going to be no reward Save salvation. Now, see, you're going to be flipping about it and say, well, that's good enough for me. It is now, but when he comes, there are going to be regrets. And the problem is you're going to eternally have to live with that. Doesn't mean you're going to be soured over it, but, but I want to tell you something. You've got to understand and realize that we live by faith in the fact he's coming back and he's bringing something with him for us. Over in Acts chapter 1, it, it just, I, I just want to make sure you understand he is coming back. All right? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, when Jesus had spoken to them, they watched as he was taken up in a cloud and received out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, and he went up, behold, two men stood in white apparel and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, yesterday, today, and forever, this same Jesus who was taken up into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go to heaven. He's coming back. Jesus is coming back. And I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be spectacular. Paul had a revelation of this. And he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 15, For this we say by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or di who died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive, 
and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now listen, I am ready to be caught up. If I live out a full life and I die, that's okay. I'm still going to beat those that are alive from, in resurrection. Some people say, well, why, why in the world are the dead in Christ going to raise first? Because they got to get a head start. They're six feet lower. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. But I tell you, I truly want to be here when Jesus comes back. I want to be, I want, I want to, I want to feel that energy, that transformation, that ability to lift myself up off of this earth to be with him. And I have to admit, and to watch all those faces standing there staring while I'm gone, while I'm leaving. I told you. But it's going to happen, folks. Man, this is, if Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, we are going to be raised from the dead, listen to me, when he comes for us. Jesus is coming. Philippians 3.20 says, we are citizens of heaven from which we also eagerly wait For the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read you a scripture. I love this scripture. It's in Isaiah chapter 25. And the Passion Translation says it so clearly. Verse verse 9. It says, In that day they will say, Behold, this is our God. We waited for him and he saved us. This one, the Lord, he is worth the wait. We will keep shouting with joy. And we and we as we find our bliss in his salvation kiss. Woo, I love it. It's worth the wait. It's worth the wait for Jesus to come back. It's worth the wait. It's gonna happen. And we're going to see him. It's going to be worth it. The Lord spoke this to me yesterday in prayer. And so I wrote it down to include in this. The Lord said, you will never live a bad life living with the expectancy of the return of the Lord. See, listen to me. If you have an expectancy that God is going to send Jesus and he is going to return, the life you live in conjunction with that will never be a bad life. You say, well, but I'm going to miss out on this or I might miss out on that. It won't mean a thing when Jesus comes back. Lord, I just bought that new car. Can I bring it with me? You're not even going to think about it. Lord, what about this? What about that? You won't even think about it. I remember when Lindsay was, was young, I'm going to tell on her. She used to, you know, we'd talk about the Lord coming. She said, he wouldn't come before I got married, would he? He, he wouldn't come before, uh, before I have children, would he? I said, Lindsay, I don't know when he's coming. But I'm going to tell you one thing for sure. You'll be happy and it won't matter. It won't matter because he's, he's coming. So you'll never live a bad life living with the expectancy of the return of the Lord because it makes you do certain things. It makes you think a certain way. It makes you act a certain way. In fact, when Jesus comes back, he's going to be looking for something. You know what it is? Luke chapter 8 verse 18 says, will he find faith on the earth? He's just going to be looking for people of faith. Oh, there's Sam. Yeah, he's ready for me. He's got faith. I'm coming back. There, Yeah, he, I'm looking for faith. Faith in what Jesus did, faith in how he helps me now, and faith to live for his return. 
I, I love this scripture because it's a great example of how a church group live. Listen to this. First Thessalonians, Church of Thessalonica, <clears throat> in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8, Paul was writing to him and he said, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Acacia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. How many of you would like to how many of you would like to hear that Life United is a church like that? Your faith toward God has gone out so that there is not we don't even need to talk about it. That your faith, because we hear about your strong faith. We don't need to brag on you, for everyone tells the story of the kind of welcome you showed us when we first came to you, and everyone knows how wonderfully you turn to God from idols to serve the true and living God. Everybody knows you got strong faith by the way you treated us. Everybody knows you have strong faith by the way you're living your life and how you turned away from idols. And listen to the next verse. Listen to this, verse 10. And now you eagerly expect his son from heaven. Jesus, the deliverer, who raised from the dead, who rescued us from the coming wrath. See, their strong faith was not just in what Jesus did. Their strong faith was in their actions toward their brethren, actions towards sin in their lives, and then uh, their actions toward expecting him to come back. There was an expectation that he's coming back. And that drives your life. That will drive your lifestyle. They had strong faith. So what's your faith going to be doing? In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was teaching. I'm not going to read this, but Jesus was teaching because they wanted to know the signs of his coming. And you know the first thing Jesus told them? Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't don't think that you can just be cavalier about this life that I'm going to give you. You can't live a life of of deception. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He talked about in verse 23, I think it's verse 23, yeah, that he said he was talking about the resurrection. He said, Christ the first fruit after those who are Christ at his coming. That's us, okay? And so he was talking about the resurrection and Jesus coming. And listen to what he said in verse 33. The Amplified Bible says it this way Don't be deceived. Don't be misled. Evil companionships, communion, associations, corrupt and deprave good manners and moral character. Evil company corrupts bad habits. Now see, what? listen to me. Why did he say that? Because Jesus is coming. Don't be deceived. And think, well, I can just live like I want to live, do what I want to do, act like I want to act because God loves me. Don't be deceived. Jesus is coming. And there's a motivation for you and I that we must live a life that he desires for us to live. Thank you for your enthusiasm. James gives us a lifestyle pattern to follow, okay? Not everything, but 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 enough you're gonna get what I'm saying today. Okay, trust the Holy Spirit will 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 help you with this. In James chapter 5, beginning at verse 7, listen to what James said to the church. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. 
patience. Now listen, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently until it receives the early and the latter rain. But you also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. All right, so there's some things that you need to be doing if the coming of the Lord is at hand. Well, I don't think it is. Then you won't live a lifestyle that got that's pleasing to God. You'll find ways to live how you want to live. Because this is part of the motivation of, the, of our faith. This is part of how we live as children of God. Now notice here, okay? First of all, James said you have to be patient with an eternal perspective. He said, think about this. And, and I'm going to just kind of interpret this as I go. Think about this. The Lord is coming. But see how God waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. See, I don't know about you, but I wish Jesus had come right in the middle of this virus. You know, but listen to me. God is long-suffering. God is patient. Y'all still with me? So what James is saying is this. You need to have an eternal perspective about the coming of the Lord and understand and realize that God is not sending Jesus back for a reason. And until that happens, we're going to have to be patient. The word patient there, I love the word. It means to be long of spirit. To be long of spirit. We, we would say it like this. You never lose heart. You never get discouraged. You never get down. You're long of spirit. Why? Because you have an eternal perspective that the only reason Jesus hadn't come back is so more people can get saved. So if I can get more people saved, I'm going to get Jesus back a lot quicker. You have an eternal perspective. And so you are long-spirited. You are patient. But then it goes on and says in verse 8, establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So that means you've got to have something in your heart that's established, settled. Not, not the past. Well, Jesus, you know, died for me. I walked the aisle 40 years ago and Everything will be all right. Yeah, but what are you doing now because he's coming? Hang on with me. Because it should motivate your life today by him coming. So he said, establish your heart. So, so here's something that you can grab hold of. Psalm 112, verse 7 and 8, talk about an established heart. And it says this. He will, the established heart will not be afraid of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. See, I wonder how many Christians let fear come into their lives during this pandemic. I know there are a lot of them. Literally, fear came into their hearts. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Wait a minute. I'm not going to be fearful of evil tidings. I'm going to trust God. Why? Because my heart's established. You're not going to move me off of who I am and what's going to happen in my life. He's coming back. I will not be afraid. Then I love verse 9 in the Passion Translation. It goes on to say, Never be stingy. Always generous to those in need. Now listen to this. And the established heart, their lives of influence and honor will never be forgotten. For they are full of good deeds. Let me tell you something. How you live your life now is going to be very important when you stand before Jesus and how he responds to you. Somehow we've gotten the idea and the doctrine is is immense these days God loves you he'll chase you down he loves you listen he'll chase you down maybe I, I don't mean this offensively but I want to tell you something if you choose to go a certain direction he'll let you go 
You don't believe it? Go read about the prodigal son. The father didn't go get him. It's our responsibility to live our life expecting Jesus to come back and expecting a reward when he comes. Jesus, now I just did what you said. I'm, I'm confident. You have an established heart. Listen to this. I love this. You live a life of influence. That means you're influencing other people for the kingdom of God. They, I know this may be kind of basic. They know you're a Christian. Here recently, I'd been involved with, with a group of um, men that, that I, had, I felt like the Lord told me to be around them. You know, they're just good guys, but they're not really living for God or anything like that. But, you know, they're, they're good guys. They're not dishonest or anything. But, but I, I felt like, and I, I'd, gotten, I'd gotten a little bit, not discouraged, but just feeling like, you know what, I'm wasting my time. I, none, of, I can't get in, none of them are getting saved. They're not really changing anything. And, and I, and, but the Lord wouldn't let me, let me out of it. And then he, then he said this to me. He said, but you're influencing them. You're influencing them. See, that's the first step. If you can just influence somebody, then you can take another step toward maybe even them get, being saved or doing something for the kingdom of God. But see, your influence is important. Jesus talked about that. He talked about you being the light of the world, salt of the earth. That's influence. And the other is honor. It says you'll never be forgotten because you're full of good deeds. Good deeds are important. If they're motivated right, but now listen, here's the danger. Here's the danger of the life that we live. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Let me tell you something. That is, an, that is a... If you want to call it an antichrist spirit, that, is, that comes straight from the devil. Because lots of things have changed. Lots of things have changed. Where's his coming? He in here. He's not coming. Well, nothing's happened. Nothing's changed. Yes, yeah, something's changed. Listen, in 1970, okay, people were talking about Jesus coming back. And there were other people saying, well, nothing's changed. We, let's just give up. Let's just, Jesus ain't coming back. No, I, I just, just give up. Thank God it, they didn't. Because in 1974, somebody gave me a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And he was talking about Jesus coming back. And that book convicted me, and I got saved. Now listen to me. So something did happen. Where is this coming? Everything is the same. No, everything's not the same. Church is not the same. Church is not going to be the same anymore. I believe we're going to see God do stuff. If you don't believe me, go listen to what I've been preaching on Wednesday nights, what I shared. We're going to see God do some things. Nothing's the same. But it's only going to be for people who are willing to receive it and really, to be honest with you, that are living for Jesus to come back. Because listen to what Peter said uh, in response to, to, to that question. First of all, he just nailed the fact that it wasn't true. And then in verse 11, he said, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be, including me, in holy conduct... And godliness. See, Jesus is coming back. And he's looking for people with holy conduct. Yeah, that means you're living right. That means you know in your heart what's right and you're living by what you know. And if you have temptation in your life, you're fighting it off and you're getting others to stay with you and stand with you to fight it off. 
Listen to what he said. In holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Looking for and hastening the day of God. Now, see, people say, well, this, that's an old cliche. What if Jesus came back today? Maybe you ought to be thinking more about how am I living today based on the fact what if Jesus comes back today? It'll motivate you to live a right life. It'll motivate you to live in a conduct and in a way that's pleasing unto God. Nobody has to tell you that. If you're a child of God, you know. There's a motivation. There's always a motivation because he's coming back. Let me show you this, just a couple of things real quick, last scriptures that'll, that'll help you with this. Over in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Because the challenge is to be the new creature that God wants you to be. That's what he's looking for. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. That we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us. Because it did not know him. But now listen. Beloved, now are we the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All right, now listen to the next verse because this is going to help you. Everyone who has this hope, how many of you got that hope? Man, I want to be like Jesus, but I want, I want Jesus, to, I just want to see him. Everyone who has this hope in him. <clears throat> you ready? Purifies himself just as he is pure. Purifies himself. That's our responsibility to be ready for him, to purify ourselves, to walk in who we are in Christ. To walk in the righteousness that he's provided. Not try to find a way around it or try to pervert it. To walk in love the way he's provided it. To live the life he has for us. To be involved with what he's involved with. To be kingdom people. More, We're more citizens of heaven than we are of the earth. We ought to be more involved in the things of the kingdom. If you've got this hope in you, then you've got things to do. We've got things to work on. And it's motivated by the fact that, hey, he's coming back. Listen to this last scripture, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to have to look Jesus in the eye and say, Jesus, I'm so ashamed because I didn't live the life you wanted me to live. I lived like I wanted to, and I'm so ashamed. You think that's not a real thing, but that's going to be real. It's going to be more real and more heightened than you could ever imagine. I, I got to say this real quick. I didn't say it in the first service, but I experienced a measure of this one time many years ago. Because the Lord spoke to me about something. And I didn't even understand him. And the Lord showed me, listen, you don't really want this. I'm telling you, he showed me myself. There's no, there's no justification. You, there's nothing you can argue when he shows you yourself. Yeah. You, you stand before him completely naked. I mean, you, there's nothing you can hide. And then when he shows you something, it is not very pleasant. And the only thing that you can 
take recourse from it is, thank God I can change it. But when you stand before him when he comes back, there's nothing to change. You can't change it. Now's the time to change it. Now's the time to, to get rid of anything that you think would shame him. Now's the time to separate yourself from anything that would be uh, uh, unpleasing to him. And you might want to go do a study on pleasing God because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. So he's coming back. Let me say this, I'm finished. Work in this world is temporary. Work for the Lord is eternal with eternal dividends. You've got to decide how you're going to live your life. What's really valuable? What's really important in your life? Because he's coming back. And you, you don't want to be ashamed. You say, well, I ain't gonna, I'm going to die before he comes back. You still got to face him. Either way. Jesus loves you. Thank God he died for you. But he's asking, for, he's asking something from, for, from all of us. Father, I pray right now over every person on the sound of my voice, those here in the sanctuary, those who are watching by live stream. Father, I pray right now that you open our hearts and reveal to us what it is that we need to change to live the life that's purposeful now because when you come, we're going to have to talk to you about it. Adjust us, Father, to what you have for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thanks for connecting with us today on the podcast. And you know, we'd love to connect with you in person at one of our campuses in Shreveport, Louisiana, or in Lake Charles, Louisiana. You can get all the information from our website, lifeunited.church.